to this Birmingham Tech webinar um, and today we're going to be talking all about creating value through strategic pricing um, and I'm pleased to welcome along um, Jenny Miller who is the founder of Untapped. Um, so Jenny I wonder if you can kind of give, just give us a, a bit of a background to your your career and um, what you've experienced and, and kind of um, yeah, a bit of history to, to yourself. Thank you, Yanis. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you for hosting me, uh, particularly as I know it's your birthday. Um, so maybe uh, everybody could join me in giving Yanis a quick birthday thumbs up or wave. Um, you say sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, please please um, don't. <laughs> I, I was thinking that, but I wasn't sure how singing happy birthday would come off across <laughs> Zoom. So. Yeah, we'll uh, leave that experiment to another day, hey. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Um, so yeah, so uh, I am the founder of Untapped, uh, and we help tech and creative scale ups with their pricing decisions. Um, so pricing is often the overlooked or neglected growth lever um, that everyone's so afraid to touch. Um, but actually just a, a few small changes can have such a transformational effect on uh, your business's growth, its profitability, and actually how you engage with customers too. Um, my personal uh, deep interest and specialism in pricing started during my 10 years at eBay. Um, I was responsible for uh, setting the fees for selling on eBay across the European platforms. Uh, so it was a, a $26 billion business at the time, operating in 11 countries. Um, and we priced very strategically to optimize for financial performance, but also to nudge customer behaviors as well. Um, and so having, having left eBay and relocated to the Midlands about three years ago, um, I've become increasingly active in the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem. Uh, I teach digital entrepreneurship at Warwick Business School. Um, I founded Untapped and I partner with various leading accelerators uh, to help early stage entrepreneurs optimize their pricing and really give them the, the clarity and the confidence to, to make those crucial pricing decisions. And I think from kind of earlier in, in the week, Jenny, you and I having a conversation, I know how kind of valuable getting your pricing is um, for, you know, organizations in general, but also kind of tech companies. Um, you know, I myself spent a, a long part of my career working for a tech company and probably the first three or four years, we got our pricing completely wrong, um, completely undervalued kind of what we were offering and therefore had a, a I guess, um, a presence in the market, which was we were kind of cheap and cheerful, um, when actually we had some of the most kind of advanced tech of, of all our competitors. Um, so that's why I guess I'm so keen for, for you to kind of impart your, your knowledge on, on so many people today um, and start to kind of um, yeah, dig deeper into to some of those topics. Great. And I, and I think you found success, right, through some adaptations to your pricing, and that were, had a huge impact. Yeah, we did indeed. Yeah, we, we kind of started to kind of elevate our, our kind of pricing um, in line with, with our competitors, but also kind of, I, I guess, elevated our, our brand proposition to ensure that the value wasn't just in the product, it was in the, the, the whole company, the, the culture, um, and also kind of the, the managed service wrapped around everything. Um, and sometimes that wasn't obvious that, that that's the value we really delivered to our customers. Um, so I, I think these conversations are, are fascinating and, and especially when companies are able to elevate their, their brand proposition. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to switch back. We're going to do a lot of switching back and forth from the slides. So kind of um, we can see the lovely Jenny and kind of, you know, engage um, more on a personal level. Um, but what I want to do is just switch back um, and kind of start the first part of this um, webinar. Um, and we wanted to kind of start with understanding kind of the true value of your products and services. Um, so kind of touching on from the conversation that Jenny and I have just had. Um, Jenny, can you, can you kind of talk a little bit more about that and how brands can really extrapolate that true value? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and I think the first point I want to make about this concept of value is that it's so contextual. So actually, maybe Yanis, could you drop the, the screen share for a moment so we can all see everybody? Um, just want to do a little experiment. So uh, let's take a piece of technology uh, that I know that uh, is present in all of our lives at the moment. Um, can you just raise your hand if you uh, have used Zoom in the last 10 weeks more than you did before UK lockdown? Okay, right. Uh, and hands up if you have started paying for Zoom in the last 10 weeks since lockdown started. Interesting. Okay. And finally, hands up if you changed your subscription on Zoom. For, you were paying before, but you've sort of changed which package you go for. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So it looks like all of us have changed our behaviour in some respect um, uh, with this technology. And I think uh, so value isn't an inherent property of a product or service it's contextual and it's also very subjective. So what my Zoom subscription means to me and my business is completely different to what it means um, to yours. So I think the first question that we need to ask ourselves is what has changed contextually for your clients? So what, what, um, what do you do that has gone down in value to them? And more importantly, what do you do that has gone up in value to them? And what could you be doing that's gone up in value to them? Um, so I think with the, the backdrop of COVID-19, uh, before this pandemic started, you were in the business of solving problems for your customers, right? And you are still in the business of solving problems for your customers. But those problems, um, those problems might have changed. Um, just before the call started, we were talking about um, some companies pivoting. And I think whether organizations like Zoom and Amazon and Netflix, who are thriving right through to those who have been on their knees and are barely surviving, I think it will be those who are really um, understanding the value of what they deliver, how that's changed and what they could deliver and kind of starting to evolve. Uh, they're the ones that are kind of going to come out of this situation with more momentum uh, and more kind of lasting success. I think waiting for um, uh, the old normal to return is probably a futile exercise, right? It's about kind of what is that, what is that new normal? Um, so then, Yanis, your, your original question was about, okay, how do we go about understanding value of what we do for our customers? Um, and I think the, the answer to that is talking to them, right? So, so whatever your business does or whatever you're consist, uh, considering doing, then you need to have a dialogue with those customers um, I think there's never a better time for an empathetic, non-salesy conversation, right? About uh, what value, what do they value the most? Um, what does your product or service enable them to do? And why is that? What's changed? Um, I often find a really powerful question uh, is what, what would happen if we took it away? And I think you'll learn a lot from um, uh, the answer to that question. And so uh, some of you might have daily dialogues with your customers, maybe your enterprise selling or just it's part of your service. So it's easy to pick up the phone. I think for those who maybe have SaaS offerings and your technology is, is more self-serve, you can still pick up the phone or start to kind of consider how to use surveys to keep, um, keep the pulse on what's happening with your customers. And it's when you really understand um, the benefits that you're delivering for them and, and how they value what you do, 
then it could pay dividends for your marketing, your customer development, uh, even your product roadmap. So what do you choose to develop next? Um, so the, the benefits can be very um, extensive. And I think also how does this, how does understanding value play a role in how you set your prices, right? Um, so I often talk about the pricing thermometer. So there are three numbers that matter when you're pricing your services. The first is the cost. So what it costs you to deliver that service, the value up at the top. So the value that it delivers to your customers, and then you set your price at somewhere in between. Okay, so the, the difference between your cost and the price is your margin. So that's your incentive to sell. And then the difference between the price and the value is, is their incentive to buy. Um, and I so often find um, business leaders who don't have a really clear picture of the cost or the value, which means that pr the price can end up being set somewhere rather arbitrarily in the middle. Um, and that can cause some really common problems, uh, such as you're, you're simply underpricing, right? You're not able to cover the cost of acquisition in your business. Um, if you're not, uh, if you don't have an understanding of the value you deliver, how on earth are you going to be able to articulate that effectively to your customers? And you might be talking to the wrong customers altogether. Because as we were saying before, um, uh, it may vary greatly from one audience to, to the next. And Jenny, how do you go about kind of understanding some of those underlying metrics within your, your customers' worlds and, and kind of how they then link to the, the kind of pricing and, and the value that you're trying to articulate? Yeah, so I think, I mean, from a, a cost perspective, uh, knowing kind of variable costs and fixed costs is something to kind of be aware of and, and all businesses need to sort of keep keep track of that. And then um, from a value perspective, I think having an ongoing mechanism for eliciting that understanding is important uh, and COVID-19 has brought that to life more than ever. Right? Our whole world's changed within a matter of, of days and weeks. And I think that will continue to be in flux for, for some time to come. Um, so I, I think even quite early stage businesses with those, those really precious early customers, um, they already have the, the formings of the, the crucial metrics that they'll need to keep um, uh, keep track of. So I'm, I'm, I was originally an analyst, so I'm all over uh, metrics and tracking in a way that I know mo can alienate others. Uh, some people aren't quite as obsessed by net metrics as me, um, but it doesn't have to be this super sophisticated view of the world. It can be very simple, just keeping track of um, what's, what you're selling, what's working, what's happening as uh, time goes on. And I, I, I kind of equally, I guess, the, the importance of understanding your competitors and kind of how they're shaping their propositions and, and what they're putting into the, in the market as well, because as that kind of conversation evolves, um, it's important to make sure that, again, your, your strategy and your, your value is coming across in the right way and in a unique way as well. Yes. So I think if you're in a business where you expect your customers to take a look at the competition or be aware of the competition, then you need to have um, uh, you need to have a handle on that as well. So not only uh, thinking through how your proposition lines up, but also how your pricing lines up. So I think actually, Danish, your example was really interesting. So your your proposition was actually at a par or perhaps superior to the competition but you'd underpriced compared to where they were and that was detrimental to the perception of your brand and your and your service and so i think i think price how you price uh, uh kind of speaks volumes about your business as a whole and where it sits in the market
Absolutely. And I think that's something that we're, we're going to talk about later on. I, I believe that our organisation at that time had a lack of confidence in the market to be able to say, you know, we value our proposition at this. Um, and, and, and ironically, we were a customer feedback voice of the customer solution. And we probably weren't close oh. enough to our customers. Um, and it just goes to show the importance of when you speak to customers and prospects as well, I think that yeah. kind of the front line in sales and customer success is such a, a kind of valuable asset to be able to kind of understand what people are really looking for. Yeah. Uh, and then we kind of, I, I guess, over time took that insight and built it into our product so that instead of assuming what people wanted, we kind of knew what they, they wanted um, and what they were willing to pay for it as well. I think your question is, is fascinating because what one question I've always kind of, advocated is you know how much would you pay for this solution but actually I, I i like yours better you know what would it do if we took this away i think that's such a powerful question and uh, one that i will kind of you know for sure sure be using um, and what what kind of impact is i guess the the psychology of you know the consumer and how does that play into all of this because i guess on one side we've got the the rational benefits but on the other side we've got these emotional benefits which are harder to put a value on. So how do you go about understanding those kind of trigger, triggers? Yeah, totally. And I'm going to come back to how to ask questions that get to willingness to pay, because there are carefully crafted questions you can use to ask them. Uh, but, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. There's um, a, like a softer side to pricing and an emotional response that um, we need to understand. Uh, so your pricing information, however that is presented to your customers, whether you have a pricing page on your website or you're sharing bespoke proposals or quotations, wherever they see that information, um, it is uh, conveying a set of signals like we talked about, about your, your brand, the value that you're offering, uh, and also what you want those prospects to do. Um, and so uh, I, I think by, so any um, buying decision is reliant on human decision-making, which is an inherently complex area. So we look to psychology to learn how to help guide people and support their decisions and nudge them in the right direction. Um, and there are kind of so many tricks and techniques out there, but I'd love to bring a few kind of design principles to life for you to bear in mind now. Um, and I think the most impactful one of those is about giving your customers choices. So again, whether you're a SaaS business with, with different um, packages available, different tiers available on your website, or whether you're offering bespoke proposals, giving customers choice uh, empowers them to make that decision because you're switching them from quite a binary, should I buy it or should I not buy it decision to um, a, a which should I buy mindset. Um, and that's uh, kind of beneficial for both them and for you in various ways. Um, so I think if you are bundling together certain features or, or benefits uh, into different packages, then you're also helping them uh, like signpost them through that decision. And you're firmly saying we're the experts in what we do, like this package works and could work for a business like you. Um, I see, we'll have all seen many instances where companies kind of give a laundry list of the stuff they can do, like a whole host of options and it's, and it's paralyzing. There's too much choice. So it doesn't, offering out packaged options doesn't mean that you can't uh, serve customers with that very long tail of offerings, but you are, you are supporting them through the process. Um, uh, car packages are a good example here, right? So it's easier to make one upgrade purchase decision than to buy the heated seats and the sat nav and the special paint job 
all separately. So you kind of, there's the power of bundling them together. Um, and so it, a, a typical approach for doing that is, if you're not already, take your, your core offering and take out some of the scope, take out some of the features and drop the price to have uh, a lower price option. And then add in some features, add the bells and whistles, go pick them up in a gold plated Lamborghini, whatever it is, and then put a much higher price point on that tier. And, and three is a magic number for various reasons. So there's something called the Goldilocks effect where we have a, a propensity to go for the middle option, the safe option. I think we're all now used to um, having three or four tiers to choose from in different um, uh, buying decisions that we're making personally and professionally. So I think there's that real understanding of what that is. Um, if it's not easy to take features out of your technology, then perhaps think about differentiating in other things, such as the level of customer support they get, or the level of analytics, or how involved the integration effort is. Um, but wh whatever it is, sort of really try to make it very easy to see the differences between these, these packaged options. Um, uh, and you will find that just by offering options, it really, um, uh, you will convert more. Because if you're not sure uh, how much a customer is willing to pay, you are automatically appealing to different budgets all in one go. Um, but also uh, you will find that it's a really powerful upselling tool. So actually someone comes to you wanting sort of the, the lower or mid tier and then they see what's available and think, wow, okay, that could be really impactful. I, I want that one instead. I think the car buying experience is such a, a good example because um, myself and my wife went and bought a, a Kia probably about a year ago now. And it's probably the first time in, in a good 10 years I've, I've purchased a new car. And one of the things that stood out for me was these kind of packages. Instead of it being kind of actually you're choosing kind of the different upgrade options, you've got free choices. Um, but also it was the fact that with Kia specifically, the seven-year warranty, which was their way of kind of differentiating themselves within a crowded marketplace. And um, one that's become kind of, I, I guess, more normalized um, as well. Um, there isn't, you know, the, that much of a difference between your premium models now, your lower end models and your middle models. Um, so yeah, that, that for me was really interesting experience from a, from a consumer point of view. So I absolutely get that kind of simplifying the choice, but also kind of making sure that there are those signals to nudge uh, a, a consumer along the, the right way. Yes. Yeah. I, I think offering package options, just as you say, also is a really good way to avoid comparison with the competition because it's no longer apples for apples if you've wrapped together a compelling package for, for each tier. Um, yeah, and also, um, so there are various, like sweating the small stuff when you're presenting your pricing is also quite powerful. Um, so think about uh, the price ratios between the different options. So you may have all experienced um, uh, situations where actually the, the difference between the first tier and the mid tier is not very much, like the price differential is not very much, but you get so much more for your money in the middle one. So that's, that's quite um, a, a powerful nudge uh, to bump people up a bit in terms of spend. Um, then kind of how you actually present the prices themselves. Um, uh, ending prices in nines, for example. Uh, so that's called charm pricing. It's one of the oldest uh, tricks in the pricing book. But actually, it really works, especially where the left-hand digit changes. So if you were to change your price from £280 to £279, that won't make much of a difference because the first digit is still two, but if you go from 300 pounds to 299, 
that's where it will make an impact on how that price is perceived. Um, I'd also recommend uh, like stripping out commas, stripping out uh, decimal places, kind of keep it as short and concise as possible because syllabilic, syllabalic, the number of syllables uh, in, in how you um, speak your price, even if that is internally in your mind, the length of that uh, price also makes a difference. Um, and even things like displaying your prices in small fonts. So we have a, a universal conceptualization of size. So the lines can blur when we're uh, between um, uh, physical size, visual size and numerical size. So customers will perceive your prices to be lower if you write them in a smaller font. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's a very well researched and proven phenomenon. So when you're designing that pricing page or designing that proposal, kind of bear that in mind. That, that's fascinating. Yeah, I've never really kind of explored pricing at such a kind of detailed level. But um, yeah, I do kind of completely buy into kind of the, the psychology behind all these different pointers and how they can have, have such an impact. And, and Craig's mentioned in the chat um, from, I guess, his personal experience and all of ours in Starbucks where you've got such a, a kind of small price difference, but you get so much more for that kind of upgrade. Um, and obviously that for Starbucks, I imagine, does kind of phenomenal things for their bottom line. So, um, yeah, yeah, great example there, Craig. Yeah, totally. Uh, that's completely, that's also the power of, the, of three being the magic number. So any coffee shop that's offering a medium and large at the moment and they want to sell more large, just introduce an extra large. And that is exactly the same with all of your businesses. Um, like that, that's a universal thing. Um, uh, oh, another one, um, in case it's helpful, is around um, the time frame. So it can be far more uh, compelling to purchase an £84 a month subscription than a £1,000 a year subscription, even though they cost the same amount over 12 months. So you're altering the frame of reference. And in some cases, you know, you could consider taking that a step further. So if the same service is $2.99 a day, then suddenly it's comparable to what I spend on, the, on my cup of coffee. Um, uh, and so that can be, and $2.99 is more than a thousand pounds a year, right? So it's all about kind of often changing that, that reference and the way that price is framed. Um, you can also use it as a, um, an incentive, right? You all have seen businesses uh, incentivizing by uh, like annual subscriptions or longer term commitments by dropping the price slightly. That's another powerful one. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting point because um, I have been doing some work with a, a client and although for an annual subscription, technically they're, they're losing money. So it's better value for the, the end consumer. Um, that customer is worth five times more to them than a monthly subscribed customer. Um, yeah. Because of the you know, likelihood of them churning is less, um, they'll stay with them longer. Um, so I, I think that, that that's something, again, people need to consider more, isn't it? The, the lifetime value of a consumer and not just for short-term value. Definitely. And particularly in times like this, where actually having that view of longer-term revenues, stabilising revenues, um, uh, is so important. Yeah, exactly. And, and just um, kind of... Sorry, go on, Jenny. Yeah, yeah. No, I just sort of talking about incentives. Um, I think you can use pricing as a bit of a carrot or a stick. Um, and so just perhaps a couple of uh, stories from my eBay days to bring that to life, if that's, if that's useful. Um, so in terms of using pricing as a carrot to incentivize the customers to behave in a certain way. Um, so we were very aware that uh, people bought the most on eBay on Sunday afternoons. Uh, 
Um, and so we offered, uh, this was back in the days where most of um, most things were selling with, by auction rather than buy it now. And so we offered sellers uh, free listing fees for items that would, for auctions that would finish on a Sunday afternoon. So it was sort of beneficial for all parties. Buyers would have the most choice. There'd be this peak of bidding activities. Sellers were more likely to sell. And obviously eBay would benefit from the commission of that more successful selling as well. Um, and then in other instances, we used it as a stick. Um, so around about 2014, uh, customer expectations were changing around shipping fees. So Amazon Prime was making inroads and uh, uh, sellers really were not very, not, um, not offering free shipping on their eBay items as much as we would like. Uh, and we tried to incentivize them in other ways for some time, but we just weren't making an attraction. So rather than selling commission on the price of the item, we changed it so you'd pay commission on the price of the item plus the shipping fee. Uh, now, while sellers grumbled a lot about this change, we didn't lose them and the impact on the penetration of free shipping was very, very significant and very immediate. So we were, we were seeing buyers that would, um, if there was an item for £10 plus £2 shipping and it was right next to the same item from the same seller for £12 in free shipping, they'd go with the one with free shipping. And so we, we used pricing to kind of serve that buying audience more effectively. And then it was beneficial to sellers in the long run as well. And it's a better consumer experience as well, because there's nothing more frustrating from a consumer point of view when you get to the, the shopping basket and realize you've got to pay 10, 15, 20% more um, because of the shipping. So I think that kind of price transparency and visibility early on in the journey is integral to a good good customer experience. One of the things that I, I want to touch on on now is is, is kind of price confidence um, and confidence, I guess, in the founder and, and the people within the organisation. Um, like I mentioned before, it's something that, that I've experienced um, in in different kind of um, roles. And um, one thing I, I, I noticed is kind of organisations that don't display prices at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also kind of come across other organizations that are scared of increasing their prices because they may lose customers. Um, now, from my experience, sometimes those customers are the wrong customers to be worrying about. Um, so, yeah, I'm just kind of cu curious about your thoughts on, on that and how to build kind of um, confidence as well. Yes, yeah, totally. And I, and I think um, a lack of confidence in when and how to change prices is probably the the biggest inhibitor of optimized pricing that i see like amongst founders it's it's really really common because it's it has such um, a tangible impact on your business and there's a lot of fear around putting customers off losing existing customers um, but i think a few small steps often build can kind of remove that fear uh, so two of the key ones we've actually talked about already so if you have a really strong handle on the value you're delivering then you're going to feel much more comfortable in talking about your prices so if i know that i'm going to deliver in, in what i my technology is going to deliver ten thousand pounds of worth of benefit to you then I can confidently charge you £1,000, for example. But if I don't know that it's 10000 then I'm not going to be ready to uh, perhaps even reach 1000 but certainly not to start experimenting. Um, then the second is around uh, providing options. So if you're not sure what uh, budget your customers are working to, or you're not sure what features they, uh, they want the most or they prefer the most then giving them options appeals to that wider wider range um, we also talked about kind of taking taking the pulse and having a mechanism to keep 
a more constant eye on customer sentiment. Oh, so I'll, I'll, perhaps I'll come to those willingness to pay questions now. Um, so I completely agree with you, Yanis. It's not a good idea to say, hey, customer, kind of how much would you be willing to pay for this? You're, you're not going to get a useful answer. But by just changing the question slightly and quite deliberately, we can elicit the information that we need. So rather than saying, how much would you be willing to pay for this? We would ask things like, at what price does this start to seem expensive? At what price would um, uh, this be too expensive for you to consider? At what price would this be too cheap that you question the quality? And at what price would you consider this a bargain? So actually the combination of those four, then you get a really good idea of what that sweet spot looks like. Um, uh, then also, um, I think founders need to think about how to take some small, simple steps to start experimenting with their pricing. Uh, so if you're, you haven't changed prices in a while, or even if you have, think about ways that you could start testing whether you're leaving money on the table. So perhaps you could take an approach where uh, each time, so, so let's say you, um, you don't share your pricing publicly, maybe on each proposal, you could raise prices by 5% each time. That's a safe increment and see what happens. See what your, it does, um, it, like where it starts to affect your conversion. If you publish your pricing on your website, perhaps you could do some A-B testing. And so completely new visitors to your site could see two different sets of pricing pages. And, and again, monitor what that does to conversion, for example. But it can be just uh, uh, sort of small, small baby steps and you'll start to learn a lot very quickly. Um, another example for more bespoke uh, uh, tech projects would be um, kind of spotting those opportunities where you think you're already leaving money on the table. So maybe there are customers that you know are in really strong industries or they're the really winning in the COVID environment or you know that the project's really urgent or you know something about that prospect that, that makes you believe that their willingness to, be, to pay will be higher because the value of that deliverable to them is higher. So, so um, customers don't pay for the work product, they pay for the end result. Um, so customers of HubSpot don't pay for that technology, they pay to convert leads by using that technology. Say you're an animation house and you have corporate clients, maybe they want an animation to um, talk to their employees about uh, compliance in a really engaging way. Like they are not buying your animation skills, they're not buying the animation process, they are buying increased compliance. Um, and so always being aware of what that end result is and, and, and that's what, how, use that in the way you frame your prices and have those conversations, that's, that needs to be front and center. And I think that in turn will really start to boost your confidence. Um, and then also like be brave, be brave with it. Like you're all experts in your field and uh, like, you know that, they know that because they're engaging with you and just take, take that step. Be brave with your pricing, uh, be, um, and you'll learn so much very quickly. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I love that kind of idea of kind of experimenting constantly and getting close to your customers, being, being brave. Um, yeah, some, some valuable kind of insight there, Jenny. Um, and one question here from, from Pam um, is, kind of what are your thoughts on teaser pricing? And I guess kind of early adopter packages, you know, maybe it's a brand new product or service, maybe you're a brand new company and you want to 
acquire customers but need to give them that kind of entry point um what what are your thoughts on that yeah so i think when either pricing a a new innovation or when you are an unknown brand perhaps entering a market then your your early customers aren't the same as your customers later in the journey they are early adopters they are willing to take a greater risk on the result they think you can deliver for them. Um, uh, and so how you price for them does need to change by the time your business has grown and evolved. Your, your products probably evolved by that point as well. But, but they are a different set of customers in those early stages. Um, so I think it depends on... Um, uh, your wider business goals at the time. So actually, if uh, you're very uh, close to being out of runway and you need to demonstrate some uh, kind of revenue generating clients before you need to secure some revenue generating clients before you go to your next investor pitch, then yes, of course, like, um, uh, be willing to compromise on price because it's helping you achieve a wider objective at that point. Kind of prof profitability can come later. Um, in terms of teaser pricing, um, so that would be where you are heavily discounting what you do uh, very early on. That can be good. I just recommend thinking about how you will uh, change those customers' pricing over time because you don't want to be crippled by kind of non-profitable clients for, a, for the lifetime of that relationship. Uh, a little bit further down the line, that could be quite detrimental. So there are a number of different approaches you can take at the point where you want to start changing things so you could, you could grandfather them into their existing preferential rates. You could do that for a certain amount of time, you could time box it, uh, or you could kind of work uh, with them to sort of figure out a migration plan. And again, I come back to packaged options because at that point, perhaps they were on an early version of your, of your product where there wasn't any differentiation. So actually, it really helps that conversation about how to evolve them onto something new um, when you have different package options for them to choose from. That's great. And a question from Rishi here as well. Um, how much emphasis would you place on benchmarking and what would you do if you had a unique offering? Mm, yes. So pricing gets even harder when you're the only one out there offering it. Um, uh, because it feels like some of those uh, places that you would turn to just get a sense check on, on the ballpark in which you operate, like how competitors price is not there. Um, so I, I think this heightens that, that dialogue with customers and the importance of understanding the benefits, which features they prefer, their willingness to pay, the impact it is having on their business. So what are they achieving by using your product or service? Um, uh, and, and I think that is heightened in, the, in those cases. So I, th I think ha the availability of kind of knowing what competitors are doing is a help and a hindrance in some ways. Um, because equally, you don't want to let competitors lead your pricing decisions um, I think they're an important uh, input to consider if you have competitors, um, but equally you want to be proactive with your pricing and um, not just be reactive to what others are doing. That's great. That's great. And, and I think, yeah, you're, you're right. It is. It's about kind of having that balance, isn't it, between kind of what's out there and also kind of what's not as well, because um, I remember a kind of mentor of mine kind of telling me um, a while back, your competitors are always one step ahead of you. Um, and it's what you can't see is what their, where their real uniqueness lies. Um, got a question from Russell here. He's, he wants to know the thoughts on your, your, your views between the balance of emphasizing the hard ROI um, and the benefits around that versus the, the softer ones like 
how does it make the, the consumer's life easier? Yeah. Mm. Great question. So, uh, yes, benefit, benefits can fall into hard, tangible, measurable. This gives me more upside, more profit, more. It saves me this amount of time. It gives me this many more leads every month. Um, or it can simply make my life easier. It can take away the hassle factor. It can make me feel more confident in doing whatever I'm doing as a result. And so I, I think understanding which camp your customers predominantly sit in um, it is, is crucial. Um, and there might be quite a lot of different use cases. So actually back to the Zoom example, right? At the moment, um, my mum is using actually my Zoom account, which has been interesting because she's popped up on a couple of uh, my work calls by accident. Um, uh, she's using it to connect with her friends and her family. It's emotive uh, and it's not measurable. Uh, and for, but for me, it is a professional tool. Um, and so it's much more measurable. And so I think you might find that some customers are by going through that process of understanding value and what is um, um, how a customer makes that buying decision, then you can also use that to speak to different audiences and kind of tease out those kind of emotionally led versus um, tangible led, the intangible versus tangible again. Actually, that, so that's another, um, that reminds me. So uh, when you're putting together different um, packaged options, when you're offering tech services, services are intangible uh, versus physical products, for example. And so it feels like a riskier decision um, until someone has tried out what you do. Um, they don't really fully understand what um, uh, they don't fully understand it. So by creating package options, you are productizing the intangible, which takes away that kind of psychological barrier to, to uh, deciding and buying. Yeah, that's really interesting. It is kind of, again, kind of all, always a balance, isn't it, between those those two aspects. Um, but if I go back to when I purchased HubSpot um, and your HubSpot example from earlier, um, you know, I was in the market for a kind of content marketing, mar marketing automation solution. You know, my rational need, the need of the business was to convert, well, to generate leads, to nurture those leads, and then finally convert them. Um, so that was the, the rational side, and that led me on a journey of exploring the market, looking at different competitive solutions. But the reason I ended up with HubSpot is one, from a functional level, it met my expectations and needs. But also, they were at the time, and probably still are to a certain extent, the thought leader in that space. So they upskilled me through free education, free knowledge, free insight. And actually, that's probably what I valued more than anything. Um, but it's always a balance because actually uh, I've seen some examples where that thought leadership is, is excellent, but the product lets it down. Yeah. So it's all, always that balance between yeah, the rational and emotional drivers, I guess. Yes, I think so. And, and your HubSpot example there is a great illustration of kind of network effects. Right. Once there's a certain level of adoption and participation in a product or service, then that is in itself beneficial. So I, I find it, um, uh, let's use the Zoom example again. So now uh, Zoom is so prolific, everybody just understands how to use it. And then if um, uh, like a, a client sort of sent me an invite for actually a, a a piece of technology that did a similar thing. I can't even remember the name. It wasn't Skype or Teams or the other regular ones. And I had to go through that whole learning journey again. And it was really frustrating. So I think um, I think you're right. There are these halo effects that, that come that are less rational, um, but just as important and just as powerful. And, and that's where I think, say you have a product that would um, kind of grow in a way like that. And these halo effects build then that, that's a great trigger to revisit your pricing because the value has changed. Um, so kind of spotting when that happens and spotting how that happens 
uh, um, means you can evolve your pricing, evolve your messaging, evolve your positioning. It's all kind of all wrapped up in a uh, uh, kind of in every facet of your business, I think, and it all kind of connects back to pricing. And I guess that halo effect is is amplified in the age of the influencer. Um, kind of bringing on board authentic influencers and getting them to advocate on your behalf and I guess demonstrate the value you bring um, is, is key to all of this, right? Absolutely. So I, I think uh, it, that works because those individuals or organisations like are a, a known and tr therefore trusted entity, um, but also they probably advocate for it by speaking your customer's language better than you do right and then they they know what that pain looks like or that situation looks like that you're helping with for sure and i'm conscious of time so what i'm going to do is i'm going to share this my screen because Great. jenny's made us a, a lovely offer um of allowing um i guess early adopters um onto a kind of tool she's put together here and um, to allow you to get um, a, a personalized report around your business and, and the pricing um, and value you can get from it. Um, so Jenny, I don't know if you want to kind of say a, a couple of more minutes and then we'll switch back to, to Q&A to wrap up uh, again. Totally, totally. Yeah, so this is something that uh, we've been developing behind the scenes with uh, Warwick University. Um, so it's uh, uh, if you are looking for uh, an assessment or a bit of a to test out um, uh, whether your pricing could be under optimized at the moment and you're looking for some kind of signposting about what you could be doing, uh, then just follow this link and it'll take you to a survey. Uh, so there are 30 questions, but you're, you're just being asked to rate statements. So it's fairly easy and quick to do. And you'll receive um, a report that kind of gives you a score on how well you're doing and signpost those areas um, uh, to take action. It, it's packed with kind of tips and tricks and advice. Uh, that we've tried to make as practical as possible um, so feel free to uh, uh, have a go at that like it, it is in beta at the moment so it's not fully automated so probably take 48, seven, 48 to 72 hours for you to get your report so don't think it hasn't worked um, but yeah the content's all there so uh, feel free to have a go with that. Thanks Jenny we, we really appreciate that that's, um, that's very kind of you and um, also, I will send that link out as well, because I can see a few of you furiously kind of writing that down. And um, yeah, it's probably not the easiest URL to kind of write down. If you've yeah. made a mistake, don't worry. I'll be sending that out with the recording uh, after this webinar. Um, so rest assured, you, you will get that as well. Um, and for those of you that want to kind of um, connect with Jenny as well, um, kind of there's her, her LinkedIn, um, nice and simple, that one. Yeah, Jenny Miller. Um, and then untappricing.co.uk is the, the website. Um, so I'm just going to switch back now um, to the, the normal view. Um, and yeah, just wrap up with any kind of final questions that anyone's got. So um, it's kind of happened naturally anyway, which is always nice. Um, but yeah, has anyone got any kind of final questions? If not, I've got, I've got one. Um, but we'll see if anyone kind of either raises their hand or kind of puts something in the chat. Not that I can see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask one final question, if I may, Jenny, um, which is the I, I know again I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs, um, especially in the kind of tech space, fascinating about new customer acquisition. Yeah. Um, and one of the the things I've seen more and more is actually a shift from new customer acquisition mm -hmm. to getting more value. Um, and more revenue from your existing customers. Um, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and um, I think particularly in these sort of uncertain economic times, it has become easier to um, uh, do more for existing or previous customers than acquire new ones. Um, uh, and yeah. So when you are, I, I think how you price affects how you're able to acquire new customers. 
So if your price point is actually quite low, maybe you're operating a self-serve model, um, then your customer service needs to be fairly light touch or no touch. And you probably haven't got a sales army out there, but then as the price point starts to rise, those sales and that acquisition process gets more and more involved. Um, uh, as for kind of using um, uh, pricing and packaged options to upsell and convert, kind of generate more business and solve more problems for the existing customers you have, Again, like I think that's where those options are so powerful because you are able to um, clearly communicate what else you could deliver and how and, and make it very easy for them to make that decision. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of see more and more kind of, I guess, fast growing organizations obsessing about their customers and understanding more and more opportunities to upsell and deliver more value so they stay with them longer but also kind of spend more as well yes. um, and then that's that balance again between kind of making sure that your existing customers are getting value but you're also putting kind of value back into kind of the new customer acquisition pipeline as well that's it so there's a study done recently with 500 SaaS companies and they looked at three different growth strategies so acquisition retention and monetization and if you put a, a kind of a 1% more effort or resources against each of those growth strategies, you'd get 3% upside from acquisition. I think it was about six for retention, but about 13% from monetization. So trying to generate more revenue per customer was four times as effective as trying to acquire a new customer. Yeah, that that kind of that, that absolutely stacks up with with my experience. Um, when I again when I was at, at Rant and Rave, we um, for a long time spent the majority of our efforts acquiring new customers, um, and then it was probably kind of five years in realised that we'd kind of got a really kind of loyal customer base, and um, so switched our our efforts to kind of upsell, cross sell, um, delivering more more value. And, and through that strategy, um, doubled the size of the company year on year for the next three years. Um, and I, I'd say probably about 70% of that additional revenue came from our existing customer base. Um, so it just goes to show the, yeah, the power of, again, listening to your customers and, and focusing back on them. So, yeah, that's, that's great to, to hear. Um, so I think, I think that kind of brings us nicely to kind of the, the hour. Um, so kind of look, Jenny, thank you ever so much for taking your time to kind of speak to us all today and um, speak to the community. Um, I can see that Drew um, has, has just thanked you in the chat. And yeah, look, feel free to kind of thank Jenny in the chat as well. Um, you know, it's been, been really insightful, really, really valuable. And um, yeah, um, we will kind of send out the recording and send out the link as well with your kind offer. Um, and yeah, that wraps us up for today. So thanks everyone else as well for for joining us. I can see everyone saying it's really valuable, insightful. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so yeah, have a good day, everyone. And um, I will speak to you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Yanis. Take care. Bye-bye.